Hi, this is Hank Levi's, and today I'm speaking with Doug Clark from the uh, Technical Center at Sigma Aldridge. And hi, Doug. Hello, Hank. How are you? Right. Today we were going to talk about water standards and uh, relating to Carl Fisher, uh, coolometric specifically, but we were going to probably dabble in the volumetric side as well. And I, I wanted to speak with Doug. Uh, Doug works closely with with the water standards and the chemicals at Sigma Aldridge. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, Doug, but you do do seminars, and, and so you're you're steeped in a lot of this knowledge and talk about it a lot. So I thought, why not maybe have a discussion with you? I know there's four of them out there. Uh, well, we basically have our water standard 10 for the volumetric system. It is a ampulized water standard. Uh, they're packaged in 8 mil glass ampules. You'll get a box of 10 of those uh, for every box. Uh, they are verified against the NIST standard reference material, and of course they come with a certificate of analysis in each package, so that way you know the exact water content of each lot you're working with. Uh, on the coolometric side, we have the water standard 1. Uh, this is going to be a 1 milligram per gram water standard. Uh, it is ideal for a daily check of any coolometer that you're working with. Um, we also have our water standard 0.1 which is going to be a 100 ppm standard. Um, it is going to be ideally suited for checking lower limits of detection. Uh, sometimes folks like to look at it for linearity, things like that. It's a little bit more sensitive to moisture than, say, the water standard one. So, you know, again, it depends on your skill level and such that uh, whether you decide to use that one on a daily basis. And last but not least, on the coolometric side, we also have our water standard oil. This is going to be a little bit different in the fact that with this particular standard, instead of trying to um, shoot for an exact water content like we did with the two previous coolometric standards, uh, we're actually going to simply analyze this material and release it at whatever water content it comes in at. Uh, currently, our current lot has a water content of six parts per million, so it's extremely low. Uh, and it is based on an oil as opposed to a solvent system to carry the water for us. So whenever you're going to use this one, you need to have a uh, setup which is designed for analyzing an oil sample. So if that was your primary means of a uh, sample that you ran, then of course this might be a very good choice as a standard. Okay, Doug. So just if I could clarify. So the 1.0 or the 1,000 ppm and the 0.1, Mm -hmm. These have been around for a while, and they do have a target, or I guess we say a target. Uh, for example, the 1.0, uh, we talk about a plus or minus 3% uh, variation. If we're within that 3%, which 970 ppm to 1,030, then we, we feel that we, we're, we're hitting the number. Whereas with the uh, 0.1, uh, the 100 ppm, um, we have a 10% variability that we work with, and so between 90 and 110 ppm. And granted, each of these come with certificates, so that might change those numbers slightly, but, but that's the idea behind those two. Whereas the water standard oil, the last one you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. it's not, it hasn't been around. It hasn't been really – there's no, there's no target for it other than the fact that there's been some round robins and, and, and there's been results that have been obtained, and we feel pretty confident that for, and the, the lot that you mentioned, the 6 ppm, would, uh, would be the target that they would look to get. Uh, when you do talk about the uh, whether or not you're set up to, to test for oil, I guess that's just a question of, I mean, most coolometric Carl Fisher titrators can handle uh, petroleum-based uh, products uh, depending upon the reagent they're using and if, whether or not they're mixing anything into the, uh, into the uh, reagent like xylene or some other solvent, uh, 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 something to break down the solvent or the, the sample. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So those are the standards. Uh, now, one thing that I, I run into, Doug, uh, with customers, and it kind of goes across the board, is uh, occasionally we speak with customers who are trying to, uh, well, they, they want to use the water standard, but they also they, they don't want to use weight. They want to use specific gravity. So I get that question a lot about what's the specific gravity or, or how do I test for uh, water content with a standard using volume. And point one, uh, because it does have xylene in it, uh, the, wa the specific gravity is 0.86, whereas the other water standards are pretty much 1.0, meaning one milliliter of 
of the uh, standard is going to be equal to one gram. That's correct. Okay, <laughs> I got it right. Okay, great. And I, you know, in our conversations too, you have you have made mention that um, uh, it's not really recommended to do uh, a water standard check by volume, uh, partly because I guess it's subjective. It's not as uh, you know when you have a, a scale, you can. Uh, it, it's the scale that's giving you the the result, not somebody eyeballing a, a syringe and saying, "Yeah, that, that looks like one mil to me." Mm-hmm. Yeah, weight by difference is going to be much more accurate than than relying upon a volume. Um, it, it's kind of interesting if you were to try that. In other words, try to dispense one mil and then go back and weigh that amount that you dispense. You'd find that it was not exact. One mil. It was probably a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. So, of course, again, it's going to be much more precise if we use weight by difference as opposed to volume. Okay, okay. Um, you know, as far as water standards go, and we, we probably should have talked about this right at the beginning, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there as to why would somebody even use a water standard. Uh, what, what's the purpose of water standards? Is it to, is it to uh, Calibrate the instrument. Is it to um, to, to give you a, a, a sense of um, you know gut check to say yeah we're we're getting what we're supposed to be getting in terms of recovery? Can you talk a little bit about that with regard to the water standards and um, the coolometric and and uh, the volumetric? Sure. Well, with a uh, volumetric system, of course, we have to routinely establish the titer value or the concentration of the reagents that we are actually titrating with because, of course, they can change over time. So it's important there that we have the, the a known water standard that we can work with. Uh, on the coolometric side, though, because it is considered to be an absolute method, we know that it's always going to generate the same amount of iodine all the time across the board, provided, of course, that the reagents are still within their capacity and they're not exhausted. Uh, but we need to make sure that everything is working properly. Sometimes uh, a sample may actually coat part of the uh, uh, electronics in the instrument, like the generator electrode or the detector electrode. So running a standard can help show us if there's a problem with those. Uh, it can also help us determine whether or not our reagents are still viable. Uh, these reagents do have a finite water capacity. Uh, when we start looking at the most of the coulometric analytes here, uh, all of them except for two will have a 1,000 milligram water capacity per 100 mil charge. And the two that don't have that happen to be our coulomet AK, which has a 100 milligram water capacity, and coulomet oil, which has a 300 milligram water capacity for 100 mil charge. If you're working with an instrument that has a diaphragm or a fritted generator electrode, we also have to be concerned with the catholite. Now, unlike the analytes, the catholite has a much lower water capacity. Uh, when we're working with coulomet CG, which is going to be used with everything except for that coulomet AK, uh, you're going to find that it has a water capacity of 300 milligrams per 5 mil charge. So that means if we're going to try and utilize the entire 1,000 milligram water capacity of our analyte, we need to change that catholite about three times for every one change of the, the analyte. And quite often that doesn't happen. Um, one of the problems that we run into when customers allow this catholite to become exhausted is it will begin to deposit salts in the diaphragm or the frit. Well, when that happens, it begins to obstruct the flow of electrons. It stops the iodine generation process. So for checking that with a water standard, we'll actually start to see low recovery. And that's very important that we catch that before we analyze our samples. Because, of course, if we're getting low recovery on the water standards and we try and analyze a sample, we're going to get low results for our sample as well. Well, that's good. That's good information. Thanks, Doug. All right, Doug, so. well, great. I, um, I think we covered some, some good material today talking about the water standards, and, uh, and we briefly spoke about the, uh, the impact of uh, the water standards, uh, especially on the coulometric side. Uh, some of the things that can happen and why you might test with a, with a water standard. And great. Well, thanks, Doug. I appreciate it very much. All right. Thanks, Frank. Do you have comments or questions? Give us a call at 800-998-6429 to speak with a representative.